and fills us with every good thing from his own hand. I told Brother Michael that this topic is not the one I would have chosen. In fact, I chose four others. I was not quick enough with the phone dial, and so uh, this was one of few that remained, and it has been a blessing to prepare it for you just to give attention to this proposition that God has given us his Holy Spirit. He has poured himself out to us. He has expressed himself to us. He has, he has uh, invested himself in us. There are so many ways that you could say that, but we simply, uh, I simply seek to affirm that truth to you this morning. That he has done this very thing purposefully with, with uh, specific intent. He has granted us his Holy Spirit. This statement comes from what many think uh, was the first writings of the New Testament scriptures. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 8 we call it. The apostle was writing to these young believers. He spent, Paul spent not many more, if any more, than 21 days with them. Three Sabbaths. Acts 17 tells us that he met with them there in the synagogues before he was uh, urged to leave their community <laughs> under threat of death. He established a group of believers there. God used his word through Paul there, Silas and Timothy, to establish a group of believers who have influenced other believers ever since then through these letters, these two small letters that were written to them to, he says there in chapter 3 and verse 10, to supply what was lacking in their faith. That's why he wrote to them. More than likely, the assembly there, we don't know for certain, but more than likely there were a large number of Gentiles in the assembly. They did not have a uh, foundation in the word of God. They did not know the things that the God of Israel had made known to those with whom he had made a covenant, with whom he had joined himself, and those whom he had joined to himself. So they needed some education we would say. They needed to be informed about specific things uh, because of the futility of their own minds, the Gentiles, the futility of their minds, how they were led about by every kind of desire. Uh, many of them thought nothing should be denied to them. Whatever your flesh, whatever your body, whatever your nature uh, draws you to, well, just go and partake of it. So Paul had instructed them somewhat, but he wrote to them again, or he wrote to them to affirm again the things that he had already said. He says here in the beginning of chapter, one, chapter 4, Finally, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord that as you receive from us instruction as how, to, how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. They had had specific instruction, and he wants to reinforce that. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. They superseded Moses. Went beyond the things that Moses said, right to the throne of God. The things that Jesus himself had commanded, for this is the will of God, he says. Makes it clear and plain. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. Says that to Gentiles. Those like us. Your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. This is the framework. This is the context, if you will, in which this truth is stated. It would seem to be not a very pretty one, would it? Not one that you might choose to state such a glorious truth, such a profound reality that, as that God had given us his spirit. It's, it's crouched in terms of, of uh, some things that's not proper to speak in public. This uh, 
reaffirms for us or, or, or establishes for us the practical reality of the impact of God's working in our lives. When, when, when the Spirit would lead the Apostle Paul to apply this to our lives in this way. This is the application, by the way. This is the application of this truth. It permeates and penetrates down to the most personal and intimate aspects of our present dwelling. God has given us His Holy Spirit. It affects every part of our being without, without question, without hesitation. It permeates and penetrates all of our present existence. Amen. Nothing is untouched by this truth that God has given us His Holy Spirit. He continues there in what we call verses 7 and 8 by saying God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Consequently, this is his conclusion to this thought. Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives us his Holy Spirit. What a, what a uh, somber and sober warning. There are those who uh, speak the message or intend to speak the message. There are those who hear that preaching who, uh, who want to crouch it in terms that are uh, the most attractive, the most comfortable, uh, the most amiable, But I don't see the apostles doing that very much. Amen. They are very direct and very specific. That does, I, now, I don't mean that they're, that they're abusive or, uh, or uh, ugly in some way. They, the, the, uh, the spirit through the writings of Paul and Peter and James and John, they never intend to bash people or, or mistreat them in some way. But they do want us to understand the one with whom we have to do. Amen. This is most serious. These things that we have been called into Amen. and the things that he has granted us by his own purpose and intent, these are high and holy things. Amen. And uh, the, the scripture record is very clear. <laughs> the consequences of those who would deal with them or, or would handle them in a, in a uh, uh, off-handed way, in a, 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 less than, uh, a less than serious, less than sober way, such as Nadab and Abihu did. We don't know the uh, details of why they offered the strange fire. Apparently, the Spirit didn't think it was important that we knew why. <laughs> For whatever reason, they offered strange fire, and God rejected it. He had said what he wanted. He is saying here what he intends in those who are joined to him, Amen. in those who, uh, who claim to want what he offers. Through the Spirit, the apostle here declares it to them, reinforces what he had already taught them, and what we, what we really know in ourselves. Do we not? <laughs> Even if you've not been uh, what we would call raised in the church, as I was so fortunate uh, to have been, as my sons have been so fortunate to have been raised in the church and taught these things from, as Paul said to Timothy, from the time they were a child. Yet it's still, we, we know, we know within ourselves things that are proper or not proper. They, they may not be absolutely clear, yet there is a sense within us of what is acceptable and what is not. Amen. And because of the nature of the old man and where some of these believers must have been, where, the, where their various lusts must have led them in their old life, the apostle wants to state it clearly. 
and succinctly. He wants there to be no question, no excuse. Well, we didn't know that. So he states it clearly. And the consequences of whether or not they hear this with faith. Hear it with faith. So we would reaffirm it. Stating this purpose draws the faithful heart or a heart with faith upward Amen. and inward Amen. toward him. One who adheres to this purpose will abhor, will hate anything that interferes with following through, Amen. with staying, staying true to it, focusing our attention on it. Anything that interferes will be cast off Amen. and cut loose. Amen. And we can reject the Spirit's words. And so the Apostle gives this warning. This warning to these recently converted believers. He's not writing his opinion. He's not writing his judgment. In other places we know, he's very clear about what he says concerning the use of our temple. The use of our vessel. The body is not for immorality, he said to the Corinthians, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Amen. He goes on saying, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God. And that you are not your own. See, he taught these things in all the churches, in one form or another. The Spirit reminded believers in the Hebrew letter, let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be kept, be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. So you see, uh, the testimony is ample. That the Spirit intended to undergird, undergird his work in our hearts. This, this is a reality, a truth, that was there before it was written down. Amen. And it stands firm and true whether or not any man believes it, let God be proven true. Amen. Amen. So the Spirit's words here, and in these other places that I've cited, they apply to every circumstance of our testing and our conduct. By keeping before our eyes, the eyes of our heart, the eyes of everyone who is willing, the one with whom we have to do. And so, this is the focus of these words. God himself has given us his Holy Spirit. He is the initiator. God is the aggressor. He's the one who has moved forward. We respond. He gave wisdom, design, order, power, creation, light, darkness, life, truth, purpose, understanding, faith, hope, joy, love, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, promises, warnings, provision, strength, guidance, di discipline, grace, loving kindness, mercy, sacrifice, redemption, justification, repentance, Forgiveness, blessing, increase, vision, insight, expectation, anticipation, glory, all of these things, the list could go on and on and on. God himself has done this. We've not wrought these things. We've not dug them up somewhere. We've not called them down. He, he has spoken. He has acted. He himself is spirit. And he's made us after his image. We know that we have damaged that image, yet we are recoverable. And God has always intended to recover those who love the truth and have a heart for him. He announced it there in Eden, didn't he? In, very, in a very cryptic way, in a way that only he can, to say so much in such a few words. And then to take generations, centuries to fulfill, to open up, and to reveal to us what he said there in the garden. Where he announced it to his arch enemy. Where he announced it to all of humanity in the loins of our father Adam. Amen. 
And then he began to work. And the scripture record unfolds for us his purpose of what he has done and what he has said in the earth. Amen. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Amen. God revealed to Noah that he was going to cleanse the earth. He was doing it. He searched throughout the earth and it was full of wickedness. Every imagination of their heart was only evil continually, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So he was not overlooked. Where there is faith, God will find it. He will find it. The man Abraham, Ur of Chaldees, 75 years old, living in the midst of a idolatrous people but there was life in his heart he was tender and sensitive to God and so God chose him and made his covenant with him God did this God spoke to him Abraham take your family everything and go to the land leave your family take part of them and leave the rest <laughs> and go to the land that I will show you I will make you a blessing, and so you shall be a blessing. Moses, tending sheep in the desert, 40 years, separated from his people, more than likely considered dead. Some may have hoped he was. But God was preparing him. God was ready to initiate the release of his people. He was ready to bring them out of the iron furnace on eagle's wings and bring them to himself. God himself is the initiator. Brethren, you could go through the scripture over and over and over again, place after place after place in the scripture record, and see how God is the one who has done all of this. He's initiated these things. He is the one who has acted. The only question is, will we believe? Will we enter in and participate in what he is doing? He has an agenda that he is accomplishing in the world. And he invites and welcomes and encourages us. He urges us to enter into it with him. It's something that we would never would have never imagined. No human mind would, would concoct this, would generate these thoughts in and of itself. Absolutely unreasonable, illogical to consider that to be the case. God himself has revealed these things. And those who believe, they are not disappointed. They find him true. They find him true in all that he has said according to his word. His purpose continues just as it began in these ones that we've already mentioned. It continues in those who are in the earth who still have a heart for him, who are sensitive to him, who are drawn to him by his own self. So let's not hinder God's resolve in heaven and earth. Those who do are swallowed up by it, as were Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Their families, all their possessions. The earth opened its mouth and took them alive into the grave because they refused. They rejected God's purpose for their generation. But those aligned with him, those who joined themselves to him, they receive his choice treasures from his great storehouse that he has said is kept there in heaven and is made known to us in the gospel of his own dear son, the redemption proclaimed and announced to us in Christ Jesus. So, enter. Enter into the quest, if you will. From our perspective, in some sense, we must ask 
seek and knock. And yet when we do, we find he was all the time preparing for us, watching and looking for us. He is the one who has put this asking, seeking, and knocking in our hearts without violating our own power of decision. He is able to do that. Moreover, he is willing to do that. Amen. He is willing. And then he maintains in us this pursuit of himself. He generates it initially, and then he maintains it in it in us by granting us of his own person, his own life joined together with us. He grants us, gives us his Holy Spirit. Some came, so the, the Spirit came on some before Jesus. Yet the good news is, as has already been spoken, it is now granted to all of us. He, he is now granted to all who hear with faith, to all who have a heart to join themselves to him. He said through the prophet Joel, it will come about after this, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. The Creator walked with Adam in the cool of the day in the garden. Yet his wisdom had something more in mind than walking in a garden. He was building for himself a habitation in the Spirit, and he has done it. Having laid the cornerstone and foundation, he is building it up, raising it up. A wall, all the walls, living stones joined together for his abiding place, a dwelling, a residence for God. His glory sought to establish something so wondrous that angels would long to look into it. And they do. This recovery of humanity in the person of his son, that is what yields a house for God. The house that his own hands have built. The residence of his spirit in those of us who believe his mighty acts, the things that he has done in heavenly places, his coming into us, his union with us brings us what our own human intellect could never, could never discover, could never perceive alone and unaided. Just as it is written, the things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. And he's revealed these things, certainly in the apostles, yet he makes them known to us as well. Each of us, each of our hearts, as he has written the words of his covenant on the fleshly tablets of our hearts, making us identified with him, making us able to grasp, to take hold, making us willing, willing, desirous to have a heart for him, to know, to drink of his spirit. The scripture record tells us that even Balaam, wicked Balaam, with the aid of God's spirit, could see things that did not appear as he looked out across the valley where Israel was camped. The plans, the murderous plans of Saul, King Saul, came to an abrupt halt when he encountered Samuel, the great prophet. In his presence, the Spirit of God overcame the calloused heart of Saul, and he fell on the ground, unable to carry out his assassination of David. Brethren, if such is the case, then what now? Amen. Now that our high apostle and high priest 
has entered into the most holy place. Now that the veil is removed, what now? Why, he has poured out his spirit into our hearts. He has done this very thing. May we see it. May we embrace it. The fact that our affections are set on these things is evidence of it. Amen. The fact that the, the, the reality of your eager listening now, the attention of your eyes and ears and your hearts, is evidence that God has done this very thing. So we would make the most of this time, won't we? Amen. This short, very short time that we have here together. And our very short time here in the earth for the days are evil. God has a purpose in his spirit. It's his own. From all eternity. From the foundation of the world. His purpose in us. As the spirit says to the apostle, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. That's what he's doing, brethren, in us. Now, this moment, he's doing that. The process continues in those of us who are sensitive and tender, who want these things, who long for him, who are willing for the spirit of his son to cry out to our father. He's doing these very things now. And he's doing them. Fulfilling God's purpose. In our own hearts. That's where it's taking place. In our own hearts. That's where he sent the spirit. Of his son. That's where his spirit. The spirit of the living God. The one who sustains all things. By the word of his power. Also resides. Within us within us now here in this place staggering fact and truth Amen. that he could do such a thing moreover that he would Amen. in those of us who at one time were children of wrath who were enemies of God he has reconciled us he has drawn us to himself and joined us to himself we still appear as a tabernacle. The tabernacle, not very attractive on the outside. <laughs> but consider within. Consider what's there behind this veil of flesh. Look with the eyes of your heart within one another at what God has done at how he has changed. Some of you know one another and have for years. And you've seen the transformation taking place. Some of you have known me for years. I sat in Brother Seth's classes trying to stay awake at the age of 19. Uh, awakened very gently and kindly one morning at about 7.20 <laughs> by his words, Gene, will you join the class with us? <laughs> He has told me that he's seen the transformation in me, for which I'm very grateful. This inner man, this inner man is a residence of God's regenerated image in us, in the person of his son. He did his work. He did this work in his own dear son here in the earth to recover what sin had damaged, even destroyed. We need to be careful as we speak about this regeneration. We need to be careful to clarify that it's not simply a uh, rebuilding. <laughs> we are a new creation. Amen. New, different, not like before, not like anything else. Absolutely, thoroughly new. Amen. He has raised us by his spirit to walk in newness of life. The one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Not the same. Not the same at all. Jesus recovered from death stronger than before. He overcame the evil one even in weakness. 
crucified in weakness, the apostle says. Now, his powerful life enables us to stand with him and to walk with him forward, making progress, and to say, as the psalmist says, though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident because of what our Father has worked in us. His own dear Son enters the trembling heart to strengthen and renew us, to stand and to walk with Him in the light, so that we too may say, as did He, I delight to do Thy will, O my God. Thy law is within my heart. This is where he's written it, so that we identify with it, so that we are drawn to him, so that it, it, it's drawing power so strong that it must be quenched and resisted, else it will accomplish its purpose. It will. For those who are willing, for those who are glad, Our Savior said that when he came, he shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you, and he has. He has done this very thing. So we share in David's confidence where he says, I shall run the way of thy commandments, for thou wilt enlarge my heart. This is absolutely necessary and true. The apostle affirms this in his prayer for the believers there in Ephesians 3. He says he prayed for them that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You must have a strong heart for the Son of God to live there. And he grants that to us. He enables us. He wants to do this. According to God's own testimony, David was a man after his own heart. The things that pleased God pleased David. And so again, because of the heart God has granted us, we can say with him, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. One of the early sons of David said this about the heart, watch over it. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God spoke about the dangers of our heart. It's more deceitful than all else, is desperately sick. Who can understand it? He has the answer. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. And then Jesus enlarged this truth, this truth of, of, of the power of his working in our hearts, or the power of the heart itself, when he said, the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. So we must watch. We must be careful. This is what we are, we, we must involve ourselves in keeping these good things that he has granted to us. Amen. God gave Balaam and King Saul the opportunity, and they exposed their hearts, didn't they? All they had to have was the opportunity. And we know their end. Yet we would give our attention to those in Scripture who had a heart for God, Joseph. And Daniel, Christ bearing our iniquity away. He provides the greatest and the final opportunity for us to come, for us to have a heart and to keep that heart where God may abide by His Spirit. His powerful life enables us to escape the corruption that's in the world, to escape our past, to escape ourselves and to draw close to him Amen. in truth and righteousness. This is no small thing, brethren. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us. 
that we should be called the children of God. And such we are. We know we are. For he has borne witness in our hearts, just as Peter said concerning Cornelius and his household. He has borne witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, cleansing their hearts by faith. This is how this takes place. This is how this residence is made ready and continues to increase and improve and conform ever more to the image of his own dear son. It's by faith. Amen. Believe what he has said. This is the critical emphasis here. Not, not the, the in, in Peter's words here, we're not talking about a sequence of things. We're talking about God's choice. God's choice of those who have believed the testimony that he has given concerning his son. He has chosen those who believe his word. The list could go on and on and on of those who believed in the past. Time will fail us if we tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. They conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. The list goes on and on and on of what God does in the heart of those who has faith. And I've already mentioned Wherever we are, whatever our circumstance, he will not miss your faith. Amen. He sees it. He is drawn to it Amen. and bears witness. By that same faith, he is bearing witness that you belong to him. Faith is a pivotal response to God's overture, to his aggressiveness in the gospel of his son. It was a tender thing for Jesus. He was, he was amazed that in Nazareth there was so little faith. It made him wonder how this could be. And he lamented when the Son of Man comes. Will he find faith in the earth? Brethren, God was looking for faith in the residence of Eden. Would they believe what he said? He didn't elaborate on it. He didn't explain it. He didn't build a fence around his word. <laughs> he simply stated it to them. In the day you eat of this tree, you shall die. Would they believe? Would they draw life from his word? Or would they seek to have their own lives? We know the answer and have suffered the curse. The first Adam ate the forbidden fruit. He did not believe God's word. The last Adam, who loved God's word and nourished his heart and soul upon it, he believed and so pleased God and destroyed him who had the power of death. See where that leads? See where believing his word leads? The work of faith in our hearts? So do not be surprised at the Spirit's emphasis of this in his word. In the record of the things that have been said and done, it continues as faith and that emphasis, it continues to be the basis for all acceptance before God. Those who believe his testimony are attractive to him. Think of that. Amen. Those of us who believed are attractive and precious and dear to him. For it, believing what God has said is so rare in the earth. There are so few who are willing to take God at his word and who are not willing to accept things as they may appear even in themselves. So it is precious. It is precious to him.
No man will stand before God unclean. This is the testimony of the law. He cannot. He will not accept anyone into his presence. Impure. The removal of sin must be absolute and it must be permanent. And we're unable to do that by any amount of conduct. We cannot wash nor cleanse ourselves. The stain is too deep. But those who believe God's eternal work in the blood of his son, they find cleansing. They find cleansing in the one who offered himself through the eternal spirit. They find cleansing of their hearts, of the inner man. And this cleansing permeates, penetrates every part of us, renewing, regenerating, heart, mind, sanctifying, spirit, soul, and body. This is what he does. This is what he does. He does it by sending the spirit of his own dear son to strengthen and enable us in these things. The apostles recognize this essential element, faith, in their own hearts and in the hearts of those to whom they spoke the message, including us Gentiles. They saw this. God's Spirit enlightened, enlightened them to its reality, to its importance, to its value, to the enormity of its truth. They pointed this out in their gathering there in Jerusalem. It's recorded for us in Acts 15. Paul affirms it again and again in Spirit inspired letters to the churches in Galatia churches in Rome. He restated a truth that Habakkuk restated that was already there before Habakkuk. The just, the righteous will live by his faith. Perhaps the most often quoted words of the scripture by the apostles in their writings. The righteous will live by faith. This is the touchstone of our standing before God. It is what makes us a fit vessel, a fit container for what he is doing and how he is working. Jesus' blood effectively cleanses our heart, our conscience from dead works so that we may serve the living God by his spirit. He and he alone is the acceptable sacrifice ever in God's presence always before his face so that we might enter in. We fail in any other effort, in any other measure. We fail to stand before God. But those who plead for faith, as did the despondent father for his son, I do believe, help my unbelief. They hear these words from God's own dear son. All that the father gives me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Amen. This is what we hear. A lowly, contrite heart finds full assurance of faith here in these words. And we can draw near and do and hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without wavering. Brethren, if the saints of old, such as Abraham, could do such a thing, could not waver, could not stagger in unbelief, but could look for the fulfillment of the promise, how much more shall we wait with patience and hope, stronger, enduring hope, for the things that God has said he will do? Because we know what he has done. And we know what he is doing. God has done this to fulfill his own dear promises. Not by the things that we have done. But he has said, I will pour forth my spirit. Jesus came and inaugurated 
a new race of humanity. Amen. Humanity and divinity joined together in truth and loving kindness, in righteousness and peace. He has joined us to himself. He has enabled us to want to be joined to him. So there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Amen. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for flesh for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, animated, sensitive and responsive to His Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. But we are able. Because he has enabled us. We can set our minds on the things that are above. Our affection, our attention, our hearts on the things that are above where Christ is seated. This we do in fulfillment of what he has done. In continuing his purpose, joining ourselves to it as he has redeemed our inner man as he has always intended to do as this text I must read it again he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness but according to his mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life and lest anyone think that these things are simply propositional truth, are simply theory, things that preachers like to discuss or argue about. Those who first heard this message there in Jerusalem on Pentecost stopped the preacher. Men and brethren, what shall we do? It generates of its own power, action, response. As the apostle continued to say here to Titus, urging him in the focus and purpose of his work, this is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed may be careful to engage in good deeds. See, this affects the whole man. Those whom it doesn't affect only give testimony that they have not believed Amen. or they have deserted the faith that they once had. So brethren, let us also do as God has directed, as God has urged by his spirit within. There remains a remnant of those who want this union. All of the things that he offers, brethren, are we not of it? Are we not of that remnant? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are drawn to him, those who pant for him in a dry and thirsty land, are we not of that number? Amen. Let us commit ourselves then to this task by conforming to his truth and contending for this faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Let us anchor our souls within the veil where he has gone before us and to which he continues to call us ever forward and upward. Grace and peace to you, my brethren.